Okay, so if we're interested in moving beyond this, this idea of Pareto efficiency and considering other ways of, of what constitutes fairness or efficiency or equity, um, we need to introduce this idea of fairness. And what we're going to talk about briefly here is this idea of Rawlsian fairness. If we were in person, um, we would actually do a quick simulation altogether about um, setting specific economic policies based on your preferences. And so what I would do is you would all be divided up into groups, random groups of, of um, five different types. And each of your groups has a specific persona. These are a couple of different examples here. There is a group of unemployed laborers with specific numbers of years of education, annual income, assets, age, and kind of background of each of these people. And then there are business executives with lots of income, lots of assets, um, kind of older. It explains what they're doing here. And so you get all of these, these different groups of people. There's five different groups in society with different preferences, different levels of income, different years of education, etc. And what I have you do is I give you a ballot about four different um, issues in society and you vote on them based on your um, groups um, characteristics and so if you're an unemployed laborer or if you're a student or one of these other groups here you're going to choose the policies here the tax policies unemployment assistance immigration laws and health insurance laws you're going to choose the the option that is best for you um, based on your um, situation your life situation and so you have to decide between um, a progressive income tax and a flat tax um, the way this works, just as a useful thing, because lots of people don't understand this, um, what we have in the United States is this idea of a progressive tax rate, which means the more money you make, the more money you pay in taxes. Um, this isn't the actual situation in the United States. The, the income levels are different, and they vary based on um, family size and dependents and other things. But here's a super simplified version of what progressive taxation looks like. Um, if you earn... 10,000 or $9,000 a year, um, you would pay 0% taxes. Um, if you earned $15,000 a year, then your tax rate is 10%. But that does not mean you're going to pay 10% on your whole $15,000. What that means is you pay 10% on anything that comes after $10,000. So you pay 0% tax on the first um, $10,000. That's like free to you. Then anything you earn above that will be taxed at a 10% rate, and then a 20% rate, and then a 30% rate. And anything you earn above $300,000 will be taxed at 50%. But again, that does not mean that's your total taxable income. Um, and this is a very common misconception and used a lot by politicians attacking um, proposals to raise taxes. Um, a few years ago, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez proposed um, increasing the, the top level of the marginal tax rate to something really high. Um, I can't remember the exact number, but it was something high, um, which was essentially this 50% here. Um, she proposed raising that to, to something really, really big. And on Fox News and other right-wing outlets, they criticized her saying like, she's just trying to take everybody's money from them. And then they were saying stuff like, if you earn, $300,000, suddenly the government's going to take half of that and you'll only earn $150,000. But that is not actually the case. Um, with this marginal tax system, what that means is you're going to pay 50% taxes on any dollars you earn beyond the $300,000. So if you earn $300,000 and $1, like $300,000 and $1, then you pay whatever taxes you had before up to the 300,000, and then you're gonna pay 50% tax on that $1, anything beyond $300,000. So that's gonna be 50 cents um, of that dollar, which is half of the money, but it's half of the money after that $300,000 level. Um, so an example of this here, um, so let's say we have this, this hypothetical person named Jody, she earns $80,000 a year. So to figure out her tax rate here, she'll pay $0 on the first $10,000. Then the next $40,000, she'll pay 10% on. Um, so she will end up paying $4,000 just on that chunk. And then she'll pay 20% on the next section, which is from 50 to 80, which is $30,000. And so that means she's going to pay 6000 here. So her total tax burden is the zero on the initial part, 
the 4,000 on the next level, and then the 6,000 on the next level. So her total tax burden here is gonna be $10,000. Okay, which sounds confusing, but that's how this progressive tax rate system works. It's supposed, it's designed to, to take more taxes from the wealthy and not tax the poor as much. Um, and so the ultra poor don't pay any taxes. Um, as you start earning more money, you start paying more taxes, but not a lot. Once you start earning a ton of money, um, then the marginal tax rates start increasing a lot. During World War II, this was up in the 90s. Um, we were taking 90% of the ultra rich's wealth or ultra rich's earnings during the war. Um, and that's how we were in part able to fund um, the military. So that is how a progressive tax system works. Um, flat tax system would say, let's impose 15% taxes on everybody regardless of income. So if you're Jody, um, that means you're going to pay 15% on 80,000, which means your tax bill is going to be 12,000 instead of 10,000. Um, and that's because it's no longer this marginal tax rate system where it's increasing over time. She's just paying 15% on everything. Um, and with these flat taxes, they end up being regressive, which means it imposes more of a burden on the poor than on the rich. Um, and so that's, um, that's, it, it looks like it's, it's equitable. Everybody's going to pay the same amount. But what ends up happening is the poorest pay a larger chunk of their income than the richest because if you're earning like a million dollars, you're going to be 15% on that instead of 50% of a giant chunk of that million dollars. And so that's what ends up happening. here. So with that brief introduction to progressive taxation, um, what you have to choose based on your personal background um, depending on if you're an unemployed student or an unemployed worker or a CEO or a retired person or other personas that we have in this simulation. You have to vote on whether you want a progressive income tax, a flat tax, if you want modest unemployment assistance or generous unemployment assistance, if you want to have a guest worker law or have strong immigration laws that deny people access to jobs. Um, and then finally, having a private insurance system like we have currently in the United States versus a national insurance system where um, everybody has um, a certain level of, of insurance. And so what ends up happening when I tally the votes is um, it's, it's been different in different situations where I've done this. Um, at BYU, uh, what often happened is that the flat tax one, um, the modest assistance generally won, the stronger immigration law generally won, and the private insurance generally won. That was in part because of how I had stacked the roles. I made it so that there were fewer um, poor students and more like retired people and CEOs and people who, um, um, according to their preferences, want kind of these things that benefit themselves instead of benefiting society. Um, when I did this at GSU in fall of 2019, it did kind of end up following this. Um, I think if I remember right, um, the unemployment assistance, I think, was the only one that was different. But people still voted for the flat tax um, and for stronger immigration laws and for um, private insurance. Um, a friend of mine um, teaches university in Finland, and she decided to, to do the same simulation in her, in her class of Finnish students. And even though they all had like these same roles of being like CEOs and, and rich people who kind of want to maximize their utility and maximize their profits, um, what ended up happening is most of them like went for progressive income tax, went for generous assistance, went for the guest worker law and went for national insurance. Um, in part because that's what Finland already has. And so even though you have the, like these rich fake CEOs here, they were still voting for kind of the, the policies that were already in place. So super interesting how culture influences this stuff. Um, but that's not the point of the simulation. Um, what the point of the simulation is, is as soon as we do this first round of voting, I hand out new roles to everybody. And so we shuffle up the roles. So if you were a rich CEO, you get a new piece of paper that says who you are. And this is what the role, the, the role details look like where every single group is completely unknown. You don't know your income, you don't know your gender, you don't know your occupation, you don't know marital status, you don't know anything. Um, and then you have to meet together as a group and decide what policies you want and you vote for them based on your own self-interest. And so you get the same list of policies and what ends up happening every single time 
is people will always vote, even in like Finland, Georgia, Utah, everywhere. People will always vote for progressive income tax, generous unemployment assistance, guest worker law, and national insurance. And the reason that happens is because they don't know how they're going to end up. Um, you don't know what your role is, and so you end up choosing the thing that is most beneficial for you. Um, and in that situation, having generous unemployment is great because you don't know if you're going to be a rich CEO or an unemployed worker who needs that generous assistance. Um, you're going to want the progressive income tax because you don't know if you're going to be a billionaire or just a regular person. And so you choose the option that is best for what is most likely to occur. And so what it's like fascinating every time I've done this in all the classes, these are the things that always end up um, happening after we decide that you don't know who you are. And this, this experiment is based on research done by a philosopher named John Rawls, um, where his idea was that um, if you want a good idea of fairness, what you should assume is that everybody is behind a veil of ignorance. And if you can choose some sort of policy or outcome or situation that makes everybody as happy as possible based on not knowing how you're going to be born, then that is going to be a good, fair policy. So this graphic here comes from Wikipedia. It's kind of goofy looking, but it, it's kind of representing this veil of ignorance here. So the idea here is that if you don't know if you're going to be a rich CEO or a, a poor unemployed worker or whatever, you're going to want to choose policies that will be good regardless of how you end up. And if you end up over here um, missing an arm or being an old person with a cane or being a little kid or whatever, like all these different people on this side, you want to create policies over here on the like pre-knowing your outcomes that is kind of best for everybody and fair for everybody and gives everybody the best chance of, of getting there, um, of succeeding. And so that's this idea of Rawlsian fairness is where if you can think of a policy that if you lived behind a veil of ignorance, you didn't know how everybody was or how everybody would end up. And if you can choose a policy that is, maximizes everybody's benefit because of, of how the policy is structured, then that's probably going to be a fair policy. Um, so for instance, this um, national insurance situation, um, if you have no idea if you're going to be able to find a full-time job um, that offers you insurance benefits, you're probably gonna want to choose a policy that allows people who don't find full-time jobs with insurance benefits um, to still have insurance. And so you're gonna end up choosing the national insurance because that is kind of a better, more kind of social and global approach for everybody um, because you don't know if you're gonna be in a position where you can get private insurance. Um, if you assume that you're always going to end up with like, you're gonna become a billionaire because you're gonna work super hard, then you'll choose options that will benefit billionaires. But most of you are not going to become billionaires. Um, and so uh, most, like, most of society is not going to. And so if we choose policies that only benefit billionaires, that kind of breaks this whole idea of the veil of ignorance. Um, most of these people are not going to end up super wealthy on this side. And so if you can choose policies that will benefit people who aren't super wealthy, um, then that meets kind of the standards of Rawlsian fairness. And it's a way of evaluating if a policy or if some sort of outcome um, is fair. Um, so it's an important principle to think of. And it's one standard you can use to judge policies. It's not a universal standard. There's no number you can put to it. You can't say this is 62% Rawlsian fair. That doesn't work. Um, it is it is a conceptual idea, but it's a way of thinking about policies. Like, is this new proposal that we're thinking, does it meet the standard of Rawlsian fairness? Would we create the same policy behind a veil of ignorance, or is it going to benefit specific types of people? Um, and then take that into account. So fairness is an important thing to think of when you make policy.